Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Like so many of us, author and environmentalist Bill McKibben grew up believing, knowing that the United States was the greatest country on earth. As a teenager, he cheerfully led American Revolution tours in Lexington, Massachusetts. He sang Kumbaya at church. And with the remarkable rise of suburbia, he assumed that all Americans would share in the wealth. But 50 years later, he finds himself in an increasingly doubtful nation, strained by bleak racial and economic inequality, on a planet whose future is in peril. And in his new book, The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon, he is curious what the hell happened. He finds that he is not without hope, and he wonders if any of that trinity of his youth, the flag, the cross, the station wagon, could or should be reclaimed in the fight for a fairer future. Before a live audience at Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center, Vermont, it is a great pleasure to welcome Bill McKibben to this week's book show. How are you, dear friend? I am really well, dear friend, and better for getting to see you. Um, it's been a while since we've emerged from the shadows to do this kind of thing in public, and what a pleasure to get to start it with you. Uh, this book uh, really struck me. I I'm so impressed by it uh, because when I initially heard uh, about it, they, they send, normally the publishers will send out a short blurb of a, of a book, and, and it, it, it comes off as uh, that it was your, a memoir. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. I don't I didn't know a little bit about Bill, but that would be interesting to find out. And, uh, well, you very quickly learn in the book, it's not a memoir. You you have stuff on your mind and things that you want to talk about and very big issues uh, that you have to discuss and want to explore. In the beginning of the book, the memoir part, if you will, the biographical part, is giving us these glimpses into two moments of your life which, as you beautifully call, in a Seussian manner, thing one and thing two. So briefly tell us what thing one and thing two are, and then we'll extrapolate from there. Absolutely. And uh, people may have seen uh, the excerpt in The New Yorker that had this section, some of it in it. Um, I moved to Lexington. My family moved to Lexington, Massachusetts, in 1970 when I was 10. And Lexington was the Ur suburb at the moment of absolute peak suburb. 80% uh, of the growth in America since the end of the Second World War had come in communities just like this one. We bought a $30,000 house that literally was halfway down a road called Middle Street. It would have been impossible to be more middle American, especially since Lexington was you know, steeped in American history. So that was the backstory to the first of these events that both happened in 1971. The Vietnam War was still raging and the anti-war protests as well. And so to Lexington Green came a group called the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, led by a lanky, young, handsome, charismatic John Kerry, uh, recently returned as a lieutenant from Vietnam. They wanted to camp on Lexington Green as part of their protest. Uh, the town fathers said no, they could not. And so when they sent in the police, three or 400 people from the town sat there with them to get arrested, including my mild-mannered business reporter father in something out of character before or since. But it obviously struck me hard. And part of the way that it struck me, I think, was the sense that this was the spirit of the age that we had just come through, you know, the apex of the civil rights movement, that the women's movement was beginning in places like that, that uh, we just after the first Earth Day, the first huge explosion of environmental consciousness, this seemed to fit. It sort of set my idea of, of what my time was. When I went back to do some research about that, I discovered that that same spring in Lexington, something else had happened. There'd been a referendum in town about whether or not to allow the first small, very small, modest, affordable housing development in this town or not. And everybody official in town had come out in favor of it. Every minister, 
the Chamber of Commerce, the local politicians, on and on and on. When people went into the voting booth to vote on it in the privacy of the voting booth, they voted it down two to one, um, a landslide. And I think as I was reading that, I, it helped me understand that I had in certain ways misunderstood the really significant currents in that place at that time. That one world was beginning to come to an end, this world that we'd come out of the Depression and World War II with, with a kind of sense of common uh, purpose and understanding, and that we were moving into a different world, the one that by decade's end would take towns like Lexington from voting for George McGovern to voting for Ronald Reagan. Uh, that would take us into the middle of the tax revolt uh, of Proposition 13, or in Massachusetts, Proposition Two and a Half, um, that would leave us in a world where a kind of hyper-individualism has marked our policy, our politics ever since. And so I really became fascinated by that decade and what happened in it and what it means for for where we are now. So you think of that of that base of your grounding, really. And as you look back, it's eroded. Absolutely. Well, let's take the title. I mean, our sense of American history, if we've been paying attention, is obviously very different now. As you said, I gave my summer job was giving tours on Lexington Green in my tricorn hat as busloads of tourists would pull in. So I told that very inspiring story over and over and over again. This was the first battle against colonialism, against imperialism, really, in the planet's history, the Minutemen, noble rising up. But you know what? We have more clues now about American history, and so we need to look at these things. I was back rereading Paul Revere's own account of how he uh, had gotten out to Lexington and conquered that night. This was, I think, the text that Longfellow worked from eventually. And and Revere was describing his ride, and he, he just in passing said, I was galloping across Charlestown Common when I met a British patrol under the spot where Mark hung in chains. That's all it said, and he just went on to the next thing. So I'd never heard this story, and it turns out almost no one had ever heard it. It took a long time to figure out what it referred to. 20 years before the revolution, uh, a Boston slave, and there were lots of slaves in Massachusetts in those days, uh, named Mark Codman, uh, who had a particularly cruel master, had killed that master, poisoned him. Uh, instead of trying him for murder, they tried him for high treason. Having drawn and quartered him, they hung his body in an iron box, an iron cage, a gibbet, it was called, and they left it hanging for 40 years there as the bones rotted, just to, uh, to demonstrate to anybody else like him not to try this again. Well, once you've read that, you have a slightly different sense of what the Sons of Liberty were about, uh, what the fight for freedom at the beginning of the revolution was about. It, um, it changes the flavor somewhat and makes us understand that if we're going to take um, inspiration from the good parts of American history, which I think we need to do if we're going to build the kind of country we want, it only is possible if we're willing to seriously reckon with the bad parts. And of course, you know, that prefigures everything that happens in, in American history, you know, right up through people in Lexington deciding they didn't want affordable housing, which was, you know, beyond any doubt, a, a comment on race in 1970. Um, um, and, and unless we grapple with that, then we don't get to look at the flag in the same way. And with those three, the flag, the cross, the station wagon, the station wagon, a symbol of the suburbs, prosperity, suburban, yes. prosperity in suburban America, that all those things, as you look at them now, have been co-opted. Well, right? I mean, we, we see yeah, the flag or, differently. We see religion differently. differently. No we, question. we see the suburbs, the communities, prosperity differently. We understand, for instance, let's look at, let's think about Christianity in America just briefly. 
in 1970, more than half of Americans belonged to one of the mainline Protestant denominations that I grew up in. Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Methodists. Um, the world I still inhabit, but now it's not 50% of America, it's about 15%. And most of them are my age. It's not the consensus part of America, our way of defining ourselves, it's a kind of relic. And instead, much as in our political life, we've replaced that religious un understanding with a Christianity, to the extent that we've replaced it with anything, with a Christianity that has that same hallmark of high individualism, uh, uh, an evangelicalism deeply concerned with personal salvation as opposed to working out the problems of the community uh, that, that had been very much the kind of focus of, of the, the Puritan tradition that we were heir to in, on the church on Lexington Green. The prosperity of the suburbs, which seemed in 1970 to be a kind of modest paradise that seemed likely to keep spreading, turned into something else very different. A, it stopped spreading. 1978, the year I graduated from high school, was the year when inequality in America reached its lowest point, what economists call the Great Compression in wealth that had begun with the Second World War and, and, and as wages rose and as wealth gap kept narrowing. That came to an end in 1978 and it's spread out ever since to the cartoonish proportions that it is now. And if you happen to get on board at the right moment, well, then you were really lucky. That house that sold for $30,000 in 1970, about $200,000 in today's money, uh, sold last, last year, for a uh, million dollars. And it was immediately torn down and replaced on its small footprint with something that looks like a cross between a junior high school and a medium security prison. I mean, <laughs> that wealth in the places where it accumulated, not only was it literally divisive in those ways, it also is the thing, more than anything else, that triggered the vast explosion of carbon into the atmosphere. The only thing that comes close is the industrialization of China. But even that didn't produce the same amount, the same quantity of carbon as America's rapid post-war infatuation with the automobile. Uh, and truthfully, the station wagon, which I remember quite fondly, I mean... Your they, family didn't have one. Though. The next door neighbors had one and they would bundle us in the back uh, to take us to the ice cream stand once a week or so. And when I say bundle us in the back, I mean, everybody just, all the kids were just floating around loose in the rear end. And, and on the <laughs> Ralph back Nader roads, hadn't appeared yet, right? on the back roads, uh, Mr. Silverman, our next door neighbor, would lower the tailgate so we could dangle our legs over the back. I mean, you would now be arrested for <laughs> child endangerment, but we thought it was the greatest thing in the world. But at any rate, those are not, I mean, the station wagon now, seem, you know, the estate wagon, the Pontiac Safari, these now seem quaint when we live in a world where we long since decided we all needed semi-military vehicles to, you know, get ourselves around. What's your line in the book about the, the, the types of vehicles are basically the things uh, are, have the same <laughs> names that we have uh, burned and the, ruined? Yes, yes a, a collection of Denali's and Tahoe's and, you know, all the things that no longer exist because right. of the way the temperature has gone up, yes. Uh, you write in the book... Christianity works better as a counterculture. Well, this is me trying to, in certain sense, whistle past the graveyard. Since, uh, since, but I think it's true in certain ways. That's since, how you can tell you're from New England. Since <laughs> twistle past the graveyard. Go ahead. Since we, <laughs> since we no longer have that kind of, uh, you know, uh, church uh, in the center of town that sets some kind of moral compass for the community. It's very true that the church that remains, the Methodist church where I belong, or the congregational church I grew up in or things, now is freed to be, in a certain sense, countercultural. Uh, it doesn't have to sort of baptize the status quo in the way that 50s or 60s suburban churches did, in a sense. Um, so there is that. Uh, uh, and I think that, it, that, that I mean, I, I know from my work as an organizer 
my volunteer work that, that you know takes up most of my time as we're organizing in pipelines or whatever it is, uh, still the people who come out to get arrested, there's an awful lot of callers you know that appear when the time comes and things. So um, God bless them. The name of the book is The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon. Bill McKibben is the author. The subtitle, A Graying American Looks Back at His Suburban Boyhood and Wonders What the Hell Happened. Part of that in the in the Christianity section is, is looking of, of thinking that on the day, January 6th, as people were storming the Capitol, there were many who were screaming at the top of their lungs, Christ is King. You know, part of the context for this book is just the sense, my sense, that I do no longer really understand the country that I thought I understood. Things that we took entirely for granted, uh, the physical stability of the planet, obviously, we turns out we shouldn't have taken for granted because now the poles are melting and the ocean's rising. But it also, I mean, even in the midst of Watergate, it would never have occurred to me in the day that, that the day would come when Americans would be storming the Capitol, beating policemen with American flags on poles in order to stop the counting of votes. That explains a lot of the organizing work we're doing now at Third Act, say, around uh, democracy and around the climate and the planet. That these things seem like existential questions that... Um, our generation needs to try and do something to solve before we make our exit. When you talk earlier about the the grizzly, the the caging was it giblet? The gibbet, the, yeah, G the, the, the yes, the iron cage that they put the, his body in. It just makes me wonder. So, and and you think of this throughout the book. So, which is the real us? It is is. I mean, have we always been this way? And and put on a good show for a while, and now it's starting to erode, and that we are appearing to be who we really are, and the and the ideals were always what we aspired to, not what we started with. And it's hard not to think that way as you wake up and hear a story of, 19 10 year olds being shot yep. by doing nothing more than trying to learn in a fourth grade classroom. My guess is that there's always been some of both parts in our national makeup and that um, it, there's always been a struggle to see which side of uh, us would prevail. Uh, you know, the, the part, I mean, it's always been a part of the American DNA, this, uh, and, and in some ways, a, a noble part, this part that fr prizes freedom and liberty and things. And then, at least at the moment, it's threatening to overwhelm the other parts of us, the part that is good at um, uh, building communities. There's some of both. So, I mean, I mean, let's don't forget, I mean, we're sitting here in Vermont, the state that sent more of its uh, a higher percentage of its population off to fight in the Civil War on the side of freedom, and they went off singing John Brown's body, you know, as they m marched off to war. Um, um, so there are both parts in us. I think right now we're in an epically difficult moment, but even so, it's worth remembering that there's plenty of good things to build on. Right now we're kind of, at least I am, struck by the sadness of the way that uh, too many of our countrymen reacted to the pandemic, for instance. Um, but it is worth remembering that something like two-thirds of Americans did try to do the right thing and look out for each other and act in ways that would protect the community and so on and so forth. Um, they, our, our problem is that our political system at this point is so gamed and rotten that it's very easy for relatively small minorities to dominate. We have 90% of Americans who want background checks before people can buy guns. But that 90% is no longer enough to make our political right. system deliver anything. Same with action on climate change. Same with a lot of stuff. So uh, it, 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 it's a hard moment. And I think the really key decision 
of my lifetime in our nation's history was that election between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan in 1980. I think that did more than anything else to sort of set the course of where we are. And remember, I mean, it was Reagan arguing quite explicitly that we didn't owe anything to each other, that government, which is just another way of saying us working together, was the problem, not the solution. His famous laugh line, decade after decade in his speeches, was the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Well, you know, ha, ha, ha. It, it turns out that the scariest words are things like, we ran out of ventilators, or the hillside behind your house just caught on fire, which are not things that you solve by yourself, <laughs> almost by definition. You you end with this in, in the book, and uh, this is what I, I love about you so much, is that you, you look at something and, and think, oh, well, this is what people are doing, and then I will do something different. So we, for years and years and years, have said, well, we have to depend on the young people for the future. We have to depend <laughs> on the young people for the future. And, and you still do that. You certainly mm -hmm. have done that. You've done that with 350.org. You, you are a college professor. You do that. You work with the, you work with the kids. But... In this book, you are calling on people in their third act that we have a responsibility, that there's something that we can do. We started this thing called thirdact.org in the last year, and really it was while I was at work on this that I was sort of realizing that. Um, and, well, you're right about the kids. They're leading on all sorts of things. You know, the Sunrise Project with the Green New Deal or Black Lives Matter or on and on and on. Greta Thunberg being the great example and the millions of young people who e emulate her, um, which is great. I love Greta. She's one of my favorite people to work with in the whole world. She's fantastic. But it's not okay to take the biggest problems the world's ever seen and just assign them to 17-year-olds. Say, you know, in between algebra homework and field hockey practice, could you also save the world, you know? Um, especially because, I mean, it's not only ignoble, it's impractical. We started thirdact.org to organize people over the age of 60. There are 70 million of us in this country, 10,000 more every day, which is more people that are now born in this country every day. Uh, not only are there a lot of us, we vote like crazy. So we punch way above our weight politically, and we ended up with all the money. We got about 70% of the financial assets compared with 5% for millennials. So if you want change in Washington or Wall Street, you better get some people like this. Now, the conventional wisdom, and there's a little bit of statistical evidence to back it up, is that people become more conservative as they age. You have more to protect or whatever. But we can't let that happen. And in this case, I think we need not let it happen because the DNA of these generations is fascinating. If you're in your 60s or 70s, in your first act, you were around to play a part in or at least bear witness to this period of great social, cultural, economic transformation, uh, 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 just remarkable period. Okay, taken as a whole with plenty of noble exceptions that I'm sure are in this room or listening to this broadcast, it's perhaps true that our second act was a little more about consumerism than it was about citizenship. That water's under the bridge. We emerge now in our third act with resources, with skills, maybe with some time that we didn't have before, and with kids or grandkids who bring into sharp focus the idea that at the moment, our legacy is going to be we're the first generation who left the world in worse shape than we found it. So, so that's why people are rallying together to work on this stuff. And it's really fun. In part, it's fun. I'll just say this because uh, uh, fight with me if you want. But one thing about this generation that is undeniable is it had the best music there ever was. <laughs> and, and so it's... And most of those, a lot of those people are still around. So it's really fun to be working. We've been getting to work with Carol King and Bette Midler and Patti Smith and Neil Young and on and on and on. So we're going to do our best to try and not lead to try and back up the young people who really are making enormous change or trying to. One of my favorite lines in the book when you're, when you're talking about this is you describe a younger generation now who is is very, let's say, woke, 
and will tell you uh, how to correctly identify everything and, and how things should be. And yet these are the same people who will often disparage the baby boomers, <laughs> d- disparage <laughs> yes. your generation, those yes. in their third act. Yes, well, the OK Boomer stuff is it's a little bit to be expected and not completely unfair, you know, um, and that's all right. And and the key part is not to get reactive to it. It's just to say, OK, let's figure out what we can do. And we can do a ton. We're in the middle of this big campaign now that's really fun, taking on the biggest banks in the country, Chase City, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, because they lend insane amounts of money to the fossil fuel industry, even though every scientist has said, we cannot keep expanding this thing. So by year's end, we're going to have an awful lot of people around the country cutting up their credit cards and all together trying to send a strong message. And then we'll go on from there pushing as hard as we can. We're trying to register voters as fast as we can, including young people. We've got this great program going called Senior to Senior, where third act volunteers are writing high school seniors, encouraging them to register to vote, talking about the roles that voting has played in their own lives, you know, because only about 10% of high school seniors register to vote for their first election. So in things like that, there's a whole mix of stuff that's possible to do to do it in the right spirit. Third Act Vermont had their uh, first big demonstration outside the Chase Bank in Burlington. A ton of high school students came, and so they were at the front of the march because they go a little faster, and behind them, this <laughs> crowd of, of older Vermonters with a big banner that said, fossils against fossil fuels. So <laughs> there you are. You know, we will do what we can. The name of the book is The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon. A graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened. The book is published by Holt. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org. You can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Our thanks to Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center, Vermont, northshire.com. Sarah LaDuke produces our program. Bookmark us for next week. And thanks for listening for The Book Show. I'm Joe Donnie.